Welcome to Meaning Over Money, a different kind of financial podcast where money is never about money. Welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in. We are so excited to have you here. We hope you're having an awesome week. And regardless of when you're listening to this, we hope it adds value to your journey. And if it does add value, it would mean the world to us if you would share with a friend or to rate and review our show. It makes a big difference. Well, I am really excited today. We have with us Christina Ellis, who is one of the newest personalities for Ramsey Solutions. Christina, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Well, I, I want to just maybe be clear that this isn't the beginning of your journey. Your your new job with Ramsey Solutions, you mentioned you've been here about five and a half, five and a half months. This isn't the beginning. This is just kind of the next chapter. And I I think it's a, you have an awesome story. I think you have an awesome background. And I just wanted to share with my listeners a little bit of context and that I want to hear a little bit more from you. But so for everybody that's listening, Christina. Before this, Christina has spent the last 10 years traveling the country, teaching people how to do this money stuff better. She's the author of two books, uh, Confessions of a Scholarship Winner and How to Graduate Debt-Free. And that is really something that she's leaned into hard, but also notable, notable in, uh, in her background, she was Miss Indiana Teen USA. She did missions work in Haiti as a teenager and also as a teenager, won two gold medals for gymnastics at the Junior Olympics. So in other words, Christina, you accomplished more in your teenage years than I have in my entire life. So welcome. Oh, <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I really, I, I love this the story about you, your, your book and how you, you won all these scholarships and you, your, your journey through school and your journey through your education and into what you're doing now. Would you mind giving us a little background on how did you, how did, well, A, how did you do that? How did you get there? And then how did that propel you into the career that you ended up choosing and, and landing us where we're at right now? Yeah. Well, to go way back, my journey in this space really started my freshman year of high school. My mom, she sat me down and she basically said, Christina, I love you and I believe in you, but there's just no way that I can support you financially once you graduate from high school. So you need to start thinking about how you're going to pay for college. Now, at first she told me that and I was kind of shocked. I thought, why are you telling me this? I am a freshman in high school. What can I do about it? And I started getting a bit frustrated, but at the same time, I knew that she was just trying to help. My dad, he asked, he actually passed away after a long and painful battle with brain cancer when I was seven years old. And my mom, she did the best she could to, to raise me and my brother, but she still struggled to provide for us. And the idea of paying for college for two kids all by herself was just not really realistic. So she wanted to light a fire in me to figure out how I could pay for it myself. She encouraged me to start looking into scholarships. And she told me that if I worked hard enough, I could figure out a way to go to college and get it completely paid for with scholarships. And that just lit a fire in me. I got really excited by the prospect. We started reading a bunch of books and a bunch of magazine articles and just trying to figure out, you know, what can you do to stand out in the scholarship application process? What can I do? You know, what do I need to do to be a standout candidate? And then I started figuring out a strategy and implemented it all throughout high school. I got super involved in extracurricular activities. I took up leadership roles. I did a lot of volunteer work. I did things that I really loved, but they just also happened to stand out in scholarship applications. And then my senior year of high school, I treated the scholarship application process like a part-time job. I just applied, applied, applied. And thankfully, it paid off. I was able to win over a half a million dollars in scholarships and go to Vanderbilt University for undergrad and Belmont University for grad school completely debt-free, which was such a relief and such a gift. Um, I'm so thankful. <laughs> and then during college, when I was writing my master's thesis, I had a mentor that I was talking to and I was kind of sharing my story at the time. You know, it's kind of funny looking back because now it's become a story that I've told to different kids and it's inspired a lot of people. But at the time, I didn't really think anything of my story. It was just like something that I did to get to college and get it paid for and to get on to my career. But he kind of stopped me in that moment and said, it's a really interesting story. Have you ever thought about writing a book about that? And at the time, I really hadn't. Um, I'm in Nashville, which is a very creative city. Everybody is a singer, a songwriter, an artist of some form. And so that just wasn't something that I was thinking about at the time. But he was like, Christina, you have been given so much, like the scholarship money, the ability to move forward. That was 
a gift and a blessing in your life. And I think you really need to reach back and help students. So if you write a book and if only one kid reads it and it makes a difference in their lives, then that is worth it. So that was kind of the approach I took. I wrote a book and I kind of saw it as a year of service. I didn't know if anybody would ever read the book, but I really wanted to help kids and just wanted to use my journey and my story to make a difference. And um, we ended up getting a publishing deal on that book, which was an amazing surprise to me and put it out in the world. And I just think there's a lot of need in this space. So people really latched onto it. And um, 10 years later, here I am still doing this. So the book really took off and I was able to travel and help a lot of students and just help a lot of people graduate debt free. I love this story about how your your mom sat you down and just just kind of shared her heart and the realities with you. But that alone doesn't do the trick. That alone doesn't get you from point A to where you are now to where you ended up. I'm just curious, and I and we shared uh, pre-show about you know my heart in the same the same area, working with high school kids through a youth group, and I've walked hundreds of kids and, and then families through this process. And it feels like there's there's a lot of there's a lot of friction in the, in regards to actually doing this. What was it that got you to the point where you just said, no, I'm going to do this. I can do it. And then actually doing it because that feels like the disconnect that I see most often, which is what makes your story so impressive. Well, thank you. Um, having my mom in the ring with me made a huge difference. So she didn't just tell me, hey, Christina, you need to do this and then sit there with like a timer going like, have you done it? Have you done it? Have you done it? No, she actually like got in the ring with me and she did the research with me and got excited with me. She she saw it more as like an opportunity and she cast a vision as like, this can be something really fun and this is a cool way to make a lot of money. And she kind of just lit that fire, but she walked the journey with me. She went with me to a lot of the practices and the extracurricular activities that I needed to do. You know, she did the research with me. She just was really, really in the ring whenever I was filling out scholarship applications. Of course, my mom is a strong personality. She's Latin. She's from Venezuela. And so she definitely set the bar high and is, was pretty strict. Um, so there was definitely that element of it, but she didn't just like have an expectation and then just wait for me to show up with the result. She actually, you know, I spent a ton of time in the library filling out scholarship applications on Friday nights, missing out on parties and fun things with my friends. But, you know, she would be there with me, making sure we had a good time too. If I started getting bored, bored or overwhelmed, she'd be like, hey, let's go grab a coffee. Like, let's let's still make this fun. Let's still make this something where you feel like you have a friend that is with you in this. Wow. I think I think that is parenting advice right there. Yeah. Just d- doing it in a different way, handling it in a different way, and being an encourager and and walking alongside of of, of your teenager. <clears throat> I wanted to I wanted to ask you about this. The, what we choose to do with our life, our passions, our giftedness, often it's derived from where we came from, the things we experienced, the life we've lived. Why do you think you had such a heart and such a passion for this that you decided to really dedicate a decade plus of of your life to it? I just think there's so much opportunity. I think there's opportunity all around us. And I think, unfortunately, a lot of kids get in this mindset where they think that there just is an opportunity, that they're stuck where they are, that they're stuck with what they're born with, that Either that or they have to go into debt if they're going to make it happen. And that's just not true. There's so much opportunity. My mom, she was an immigrant from Venezuela. So she came from a low-income area of Caracas, Venezuela. And her story is really interesting. She actually went with a group of friends one day randomly. She didn't even know where she was going. Her friends were going to this thing and asked her if she wanted to come along. And it turned out it was a test where she was applying to win a scholarship. (laughs) And um, she was the only one of her friends who passed. And they called her and said, you have two weeks to decide one of eight countries that you want to go to. And she went from low-income area in Caracas, Venezuela, to the United States in college, learned English as a second language, and, you know, got our family to that level. And then her casting that vision in my life, she's like, hey, you know, we're more of a low-income family, but this is what your life can look like. You can go to one of those fancy, expensive private schools and do it debt-free if you want to, if you're willing to work for it. And let's (laughs) research all these opportunities, these scholarships, and these different ways that you can make it happen. And I just think that's so cool to have experienced that fire in my blood and being able to go, wow, like even though we're here, we can go there. And it's like, I see so many students, I talk to so many students who maybe feel a little bit discouraged or like they can't do it. And just being able to help light that fire in them to go, no, 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 like you can do it. There's so many different opportunities. Like let's 
let's map out how your situation can change and how you can accomplish your dreams and goals. It's just really exciting to me. No, I love that. Thank, thanks for sharing that. And especially with the kind of the family background and, and the context of that. And, and I, I, I always say that whether we like it or not, the way we are today is, is largely attributed to what we experienced in the past. And whether we were taught in the past while we were growing up, we were learning. We were learning either through words or actions. And I, I really think that your, your story and journey is a testament to, to that. Yeah, I'm huge on growth mindset and helping kids understand that mindset of like, you know, you can always grow and improve and change. And I'm so thankful. I feel like my mom, she really instilled that in me. Like you mentioned earlier, I was Miss Indiana Teen USA. And I remember getting the letters for a big pageant in the mail. And, you know, I'd never done a pageant. And I saw all these girls on these cool stages. And I showed it to my mom and was like, can I do this? And she was like, well, if you're willing to work at it. And like, she really encouraged me to Um, just pour into figuring out how I could do that, you know, how I could stand out in the process. And I just love the way she always would, you know, encourage me to do something and help me believe that I could do anything that I set my mind to, but also just encourage that work and that ability to grow and change and improve. I I love that, that we can, we have the mindset and then we apply the plan, develop the plan and then make it happen. The thing that I think you see probably is what I see in young people is that the culture that tells them they can't. That's culture that says there is no way. If you want to go to college, of course, you're going to have student loans. It's just what we do. I had loans. So of course, son or daughter, you're going to have, you're going to have loans. That's kind of the normal way. What do you think is, a, what, how, how do you attribute that current narrative, that current reality in, in America? How do you think we got here? And I know you've, you've talked to so many people about this, what do you attribute that to? How, how have we gotten here? Yeah, we see that so much, which is so sad. That's one of the big motivations behind the Borrowed Future documentary is exposing the toxic system behind the student loan industry and kind of how it's been started, how it's been formed, and why so many students fall into that trap. But I hear it all the time where it's almost like an assumption from students where it's like, of course, I'm going to take out student loans. Everybody does and Everybody takes out student loans. And, and it's just really sad. There's not been a lot of accountability in higher education with rising tuition costs. There's been a lot of, like you said, parents who took out student loans and they say they kind of just assume themselves. But I really think there's somewhat of a lack of leadership for young kids in their finances. You know, that we need more financial literacy and for them to understand the long-term implications. We should not be selling 18-year-olds thousands of dollars in debt. Like that is insane. A lot of them have never even looked at a budget. They don't know what $30,000 or $100,000 looks like when you're trying to pay it back and after college. So it's like, I really think it's a lack of financial literacy and information with young kids and people not sitting down and having those real conversations about what, what, what their finances are going to look like and what debt really means. I I do. I, I've, the part you said about being 18 years old, 17 years old and making these, these life altering decisions, I always make a joke, but it's a, it's not a joke. But you know, parents will they'll not trust their kid at home for the weekend by themselves, and then two weeks later, will let them make a significant life altering decision to throw themselves into a hundred thousand of student loans. It's crazy. It is so crazy. I read a study not long ago, and I need to find the exact number, but it was a really high percentage of students that when they get their financial aid package, they don't even realize that when they see the total number at the bottom, that a portion of that is student loans. So that means that a lot of kids are like signing on the dotted line saying, yes, I accept this financial aid package, not even really understanding that $15,000 of that is money that they have to pay back. And that's just sad. And, and then, you hear, then you hear the, well, I want my kid to have skin in the game. So we're going to have them get the student loans. Well, I'm sorry, mom and dad, but they don't feel that until it's too late. They're, they don't they don't feel the skin of the game because they just signed the dotted line, live their four years of fun, then reality sets in. And I think the Borrowed Future documentary really showcased that, the reality that hit, but it hits a little too late. Right. And that's part of the problem is that I mean, a lot of these kids, they just don't know until it's too late and then they're feeling the pain and then it feels more like a punishment versus a lesson, right? They're learning this lesson and perhaps hopefully they take that lesson later into life um, as they approach other areas of their finances. But really, they feel like they're getting punished after graduation. And then, of course, now there's all these studies talking about all the things that students are giving up as they enter into their 20s 
because of student loan debt. There were, there's talks about people not buying houses, not starting families, not getting married because they feel like they're trapped in their burden, their student loan debt. I had a I had a conversation one of my one of my classes I was talking to a bunch of teenagers and I and I and I and I explained to them how they can go to college debt free and walk them through the process and this one particular young lady she was really excited and she she there was like this weight that was lifted off of her because I think she was scared and she was nervous mm-hmm. and anxious and she came back the following week and she said Travis I told my mom all about how we can do this and that I can go to college debt free. And I'm like, that's awesome. What'd she say? And she said, uh, she said, that's not true. You were lying. And then she was dejected. Fast forward, fast forward. She graduated college five years later um, with about 65,000 of student loans. And and that's, that's, I feel like that's where we're at. And I'm, I'm glad that to have people like you in your heart to say, no, you deserve better and can have better. Are you you seeing similar stories in in your journey as you talk to families and teenagers? A little mix of both. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, there are some students who they're surrounded in an atmosphere where it's just so normalized that they end up taking the path of debt. Um, But I mean, I'm hopeful that we're having the long-term influence of really getting people to think differently Um, I mean, obviously, student loan debt is still growing and still a major problem. So I feel like there's so much work to do. That's part of why, you know, I feel so motivated to keep getting out there because we really do have to shift this culture. You know, that's one of our goals here is to, you know, get out there and help people so much that the toxic culture, it has to change. And I mean, as much as I I want to believe we've shifted the needle, I still think there's so much work to do because it's just very, very pervasive. What has been the response to the to the documentary has has have this been a groundswell of people saying, "Wow, this is amazing! I want to do this." Or do you guys feel like you just have this wave of criticism saying, "Nah, that's just that can't that's not possible. That's a lie. That's somebody else. That can't be me." Where are you seeing that feedback? Yeah, we've had great feedback so far. We've had actually groundswell people go, "Wow, like this is really well laid out in a way that." opens eyes and shifts mindsets. And for me, even personally, being in this industry for 10 years, I've loved it and talked to other people who are um, experts in the field that love it because it's like finally a resource that we can give kids to open their eyes and go, whoa, because it's telling real stories about people who did sign on the dotted line and what that looks like afterwards. There's a guy in the documentary who literally was donating plasma to try to pay his bills and to try to take to pay off his debt. And it's like, that is painful. And to actually see what that looks like, it's really eye-opening. Plus the documentary, it shows examples of people who did it debt-free. So it's got that good balance. Um, so we're, we're having really great feedback because it's like, wow, this is, this is a very eye-opening way to get kids to see the full picture without just saying, hey, you should do this. Or just having a teacher or an author say, you shouldn't go into debt. It's like they're seeing real people who've experienced both sides of the spectrum. Yeah, the, the young the young man that was that that changed colleges at the last minute, and he was he was flipping flipping tractors and just grinding grinding yep. to get there, and to see the pure joy of getting there, he sacrificed and sacrificed and sacrificed and took the road less traveled, and he did it. I love I love that, and I those stories a couple of the stories they're heartbreaking. Like you mm-hmm. watch them and you can just feel the the tension, you feel the weight of the reality in, in my profession and what I do, I walk alongside of a lot of people that are in very similar shoes and, and people, and people always say, well, I'm going to graduate college. It's only 20,000. It's not a big deal. It's only 30,000. I'll get out. It, it, the payments won't be that much, but for it, it doesn't always work that way. All of a sudden 20 becomes a hundred real fast. Yep. And that's why I always like to walk students through an actual budget. So I have this example I use in my presentations where I take the average tuition at a private school, a private university over four years. And let's say it's like a university that costs $75,000 a year and the student gets scholarships for over half. Let's say they're like, okay, you know, I got almost two thirds in scholarships. I'm only taking out $25,000 a year only. And then that's $100,000 over the course of four years. And then I take the average starting salary at that school and put together a budget and show them what their take home pay would be after the, like a very normal conservative budget. And then I factor in student loans and it's like, whoa, they can see that 
even if they did get the great starting salary, they're still $400 over their budget or $600 over their budget. And it's like very eye opening to be like, oh, wait, no, this is this is not as easy as they say it is. Because I personally remember going to tour a lot of schools and I had people during these tours say like, oh, yeah, it's it's not going to be a big deal to pay back these student loans because you're going to get a great job and a great starting salary <laughs> because our degree is so prestigious. And it's like, wait a minute, when you really break down the numbers and you see what that looks like in real life, it's like, hmm, that's not so easy. That actually is going to hurt quite a bit after graduation. Absolutely. The math, the math, the weight of the math can just feel so heavy in terms of, you know, the meaning piece, you know, meaning over money. The part that's so hard for me to watch is people having to make choices around money coming, you know, you graduate college and then maybe you meet somebody and you decide you want to get married. And this should be an amazing season of life. But for so many, it can feel so heavy. Because you're choosing careers, not because it's what you feel called to do, not because that it, you know, you're going to wake up every day excited for what you're about to do, but because those payments have to be made, right. and they have to be made next month and every month after that, and it's it's so hard to watch this young generation crush themselves even before the game begins. Well, and I think it's so sad to see that side of things, but it's also really encouraging for young people because it's like, it doesn't have to be that way. And you mentioned David, who was in the documentary, who chose the other school and he hustled and he sold lawn mowers and he did all these different things to graduate debt free. And I think that's a huge factor to look at too, is I tell students all the time, it's like you walk around Ramsey, we have you know over a thousand employees here. A lot of people went to amazing, really competitive schools, but there are also people here who went to community college or didn't go to college at all. And they're sitting right next to people who got these big, fancy, expensive degrees doing the exact same job. But they you know, did internships. They, they hustled. They met people. They networked. They did all these different things to get here. And at the end of the day, a lot of it comes down to you and your own desire, your own motivation and your own grit and willingness to put yourself out there and work hard. It doesn't have to come as a result of some fancy expensive degree. You know, you can get that degree, but if you can, if you can do it debt free, but you could also go to a community college and then transfer to a four year school. There's so many different ways to get there and just be strategic in your own journey. When I was what I'm glad you mentioned that when I was watching the documentary in, in that the gentleman that, that did it, he, he made those sacrifices. It reminded me of a former uh, former youth group kid. His name's Camden, and he's in college right now. And he told me back in high school, he said, Travis, I am going to graduate college debt-free. He says, it's going to happen. And he did what you just said. He started out in junior college, and then he transferred to a four-year school, and he builds bridges in the summer. And I always ask him, how's work going? He says, he goes, I hate it. He goes, I hate it, but it's exactly where I need to be. And about every semester, him and I will see each other and he'll say, I'm still on track. I'm still on track. And I'm so proud of him. And, and I'm, I'm more proud that uh, I'm more proud of the example that he's setting for those around him and showing people, no, you can do this. We can do this. And I, I think stories like his stories, like the gentleman in the, in the documentary, that's where change I think is coming. That's incredible. That's amazing. And the thing is, is it's for a season too, right? Like he's not going to have to be building bridges forever. He's going to get his degree and perhaps move into a different role. But it's like that work ethic for one that he develops in that season is amazing. And then two, it's just like he's laying such a strong foundation financially for the future that it's like it, it, it's we need to remind kids that like it's OK to work really hard for a season of life and sacrifice and do things that you don't necessarily what want to do in that season so that you can get to where you want to go so that you can have the dream job someday and not have the stress and financial burden of student loans. There's there's so many ways that we can do this college different. We can pay for it without debt. One of them being scholarships. That's oh. that's That was your bread and butter. That's where yeah. you made your mark and where your story really just took off. What is your, what is your best advice, your encouragement to students because there's a stigma with scholarships and the stigma is this, they're a waste of time. I'm not going to get it. If I get it, it's not going to matter anyway. So I will just sign the dotted line. What, what do you have to say about that? Well, there are tons of scholarships out there and yes, they may take some time to apply to, but they're worth it. And the process gets easier over time. So a lot of students see the essay and they're like, whoa, 
an essay. I don't want to have to do an essay for every single scholarship. And yes, that feels overwhelming. But here's the thing is a lot of the scholarship essays, they're centered around similar topics. So typically, if you've done five or six essays, you usually have a foundation to apply for several different scholarships. So you can recycle those application essays. And then over time, it's like, oh, wow, like copy, paste, modify it a bit to fit the scholarship and then apply for several. So one, the process gets easier over time. And then two, apply for a ton of scholarships. So with that, if you're putting in a ton of work, I read a statistic recently that said that like students win typically like one out of every 10 scholarships that they apply for, or it may have been one out of 14. Um, I need to find that out for sure. But it, it's just proof that it's like a numbers game. Like you've got to put yourself out there. If you've only applied for 10 scholarships and you're like, oh, I haven't heard anything back. Well, you're normal. Like you're right on track. Like you've got to just apply, 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 and put yourself out there um, if you really want to win. And then when you really think about it, it's like, if you spend two hours applying for a scholarship that allows you to win a thousand dollars, that's like making 500 bucks an hour. Like where else are you going to make that kind of money in high school? And so it's important to think that this is real money that will pay off in the long run. And I think it's hard to picture because um, like we said, a lot of people don't talk to students about money and they're just thinking, oh, this is like long term. This is going to affect me long term. But this is very real money. There are people paying back hundred a hundred thousand dollars in student loans. And it's like, they're having to pay it back at 20, $30 an hour. And it's like, if you could have made $500 an hour to pay it off like that, that's substantial and significant income. And you made that point in the documentary as well. The point of, well, how about we just stop talking about the small, the small win percentage and start talking about a dollar per hour. And you, you use that example and you play that out. I had that conversation with another young lady. This is many years ago. And she came back several months after we talked about the importance of scholarships and the opportunity that you experienced. And she said, Travis, and she was super hot. She, I mean, not, she was, she was mad. She was angry. And she was like, Travis, I spent all day applying for all these scholarships. And all I won was one stupid $1,000 scholarship. And I said, well, well, how many did you apply for? And she said, I don't know, eight to 10. And I said, okay, well, how, how long did it take you? And she's like, it probably took me, like, probably took me like 10 hours to do all of this. And then I asked her, to your point, I asked her, what, what's the highest paying job you've ever had? And she said, $11 an hour. I said, great. I said, you just made $100 an hour applying for scholarships. And then I asked her, well, is it renewable? Is it a renewable scholarship? And she said, well, yeah, it is. And I said, you just made $400 an hour. How about you just keep going and doing that? And, and she yes. didn't want to hear that because it felt, it, it felt like it was still lost because she only won one out of eight or 10. But to your point, Christina, it's a numbers game. We just need to play the numbers. Yep. Got to put the numbers, got to put yourself out there because it does stack up. It adds up. That's such a great example. I, I love that. That is, that's incredible. And it's also sad when on the flip side of that, I've talked to so many scholarship administrators who, especially in this local scholarship realm, who have had no one apply to their scholarships or one person apply to their scholarship. And it's like, there are a ton of scholarships out there where, you know, they're feeling the weight on the other end of things of why aren't students putting the time to put into this? This is 500 bucks. And if anybody would have applied, they would have got an easy $500. It's like, whew, yeah, that's real money. It's significant money. And it's money that legit pays off in the long run. And I think that's the challenge that we face in this financial world is helping people connect those dots to be able to, to see the value because it's so much easier to sign those dotted lines, as you know, but it takes work. It takes sacrifice. It takes persistence to do the scholarship stuff. I think the biggest roadblock I see, and, and I would love to hear your advice on this. The biggest roadblock I see is students are just all applying for the, e the, the low hanging fruit. They're applying to the ones that everyone else is applying for. Thus, the percentage of winning is low. What's your best advice on how do we find these scholarships? How do we find the opportunities that maybe others aren't seeing that we do have a higher probability of winning? Yeah, I like what you're saying about 
um, students needing to have that long-term perspective. I think one of the challenges we have right now is we kind of live in this like YOLO world, <laughs> like you only live once. And so there is this like short-sighted perspective of like, well, if I apply for a scholarship, I can only use it for college next year. And it doesn't really feel like this thing that immediately impacts now versus it's just easier to wait until, you know, later to deal with it. So I just think that's so important to cast that vision of, you know, why does this matter and what does it look like long term and why does this pay off? Um, but in terms of how to find scholarships that really matter, that'll help students stand out, it's important for students to first like write down a list of unique qualities that they can look um, that'll help them look for scholarships. Those are a ton of niche scholarships given away. Like you said, a lot of students will just apply for the big, well known one, but there are scholarships given away for almost every reason you can think of. There's scholarships given away for loving to vacuum, for having the most creative peanut butter sandwich recipe, for being tall, for being short, for being a vegetarian, and for having the most zomb the best zombie apocalypse escape plan. So it's like there are just scholarships out there for so many um, just wild reasons, interesting reasons. But even if you're like, let's say you're trying to think through unique qualities about you, you could put down like what you want to major in, what kind of sports you're involved in. Do you do volunteer work? What kind of volunteer work? So make a list of all of those unique qualities, because that'll help you search for specific niche qualities that fit you, niche scholarships that fit you. Um, of course, there are scholarship databases where you can go in there and type in those qualities and it will generate a list of scholarships that fit you. It's really important. I love encouraging students to look locally because a lot of those local scholarships have a lot less competition. Um, your guidance counselor is often the best point person for that. So a lot of scholarships, you know, they're still um, there. There's some scholarships are still back in the olden days, just having paper and pen application. So if you're going to find those scholarships, a lot of times the people giving away those scholarships are going to guidance counselors in the community. So you want to make sure you're constantly in touch with your guidance counselor. Ask your guidance counselor anytime, you know, they have a scholarship come through, especially ones that don't have a lot of competition. Point them your way. <laughs> those emails that you get with lists mm -hmm. of scholarship from your guidance counselors, you want to pay attention to those because a lot of those scholarships are gold mines. I talked to a local scholarship provider at one point. It was actually the parent of the daughter who won. And he had talked to the scholarship provider and they were giving away um, three $2,000 scholarships. It was a regional tire company. And it turns out only one student applied. So they ended up giving all three scholarships to the one student that applied for like $6,000. <laughs> so it's like, that is awesome when you can find those types of scholarships that are pretty local, pretty niche, and just hopefully don't have a lot of competition. Absolutely. I love those examples. My my favorite one out of, of my youth group kids, they ended up getting a $500 scholarship to uh, from a coffee company for writing just a very short essay on how does coffee add value to your life? And that was, that is and awesome. they said, and, and it was the same thing. They only had a couple applicants and there we are. That is awesome. Well, it's cool because it's yeah. like anyone can give away a scholarship, right? Like, so it's like, we're seeing more scholarships that have really interesting qualities. A lot of times people think of scholarship winners as like the star athlete or the valedictorian, but it's like people, I've seen scholarships by people who had C averages when they were in high school and they didn't feel like they were a standout for scholarships. So now they've created a scholarship because they've become super successful and they're giving away scholarships for people with a C average, which it's just neat because it's like, wow, what a cool, cool way to give back and serve people. Yeah. Maybe taking a step back, we talked about how we're unfairly putting 17 and 18 year olds on the firing line yeah. here and putting them in a spot to really mess up their lives. And I did an episode not that long ago where I really talked about this idea that if you have student loans, adults, adults in the room, if you have student loans, that, that was, it was kind of your fault, but it wasn't yeah. like you deserved better and sure you made choices, but you deserve to have somebody walking alongside of you, helping you make this choice. And I, it's, it's crazy to me, and my life's no different. I remember you know, my parents said, you know, we want you to go wherever you want to go. Wherever you want to go, we want you to go there, and we'll make it happen. And for me, I, I ended up going out of state because out of state was different than what other people were doing. And I liked the campus. I liked the city, I, and, and I did. And, I, and consequently... I, I didn't know where we were going with this, but I ended up with a bunch of student loans. And I feel like kids deserve better than just having to make these choices on their own. And this is where I was so impressed by your story. I've heard your story in a couple different settings, but the two things that really stood out to me that I think are parenting, parenting hero wins. 
Number one, sharing the reality with your teenager and saying, here is how it's going to work. And, and I always say, you parents, you don't have you don't have an obligation to pay for your kids' college, but you do have an obligation to walk alongside of them and help them. And I just feel like your mom nailed this piece so well that that should be the model. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that's one of the things I always talk about is that like you have to have real conversations with your students. Like you said, yes, 18 year olds are making their decision and it's that it's their decision. However, their prefrontal cortex isn't even fully developed at that age. Like, do they really understand the decision that they're making? And for many people who have a ton of student loan debt, the answer is no, they didn't actually understand that. They didn't understand how that would feel in the long run. They didn't understand the implications and they trusted the adults around them. So it's like they they had these adults telling them, like, take out these student loans. It's OK. Like you would think when you're a kid that the adults around you are protecting you. And I know parents are. However, the people who are trying to get them to sign on the dotted line for student loans, like they may not have their best interest in mind. They have a goal of getting them into the school. They have a goal of, mm -hmm. you know, enrollment. They have that's their goal. And so it's like important for parents to have those real conversations with their kids, because if they don't, then there's these people over here ready to talk to them and point them in the direction that they feel is best fit. And it's it's just so important, even though those conversations can be awkward and hard and your kid may not want to hear it, you've got to have it because if you don't, somebody else is going to have it. <laughs> it's probably also going to be the person on campus offering them a $10 t-shirt or a free t-shirt for them to sign up for a credit card. Um, there's just so much temptation out there that it's like, if you don't take ownership of that conversation, who will? And it's just, it's a mm -hmm. challenge for parents. So I am grateful. I remember being a student, having that conversation with my mom and kind of feeling a little bit offended at the moment. Like, why are you telling me this? I'm young. Like, what? <laughs> Come on. Like, I don't understand this. But at the same time, like she planted that seed and she kept planting that those seeds and just paying attention to those seeds and nurturing those seeds so that eventually I was like, you know, what? I want this for myself. I don't want to go into debt. I want to be successful financially. But she had to be willing to have that conversation, even if I was defensive and I didn't love talking to her about it at first. Looking back and looking back into your your 15 year old mind, do you feel that was a, a kind of an inflection point in your life? having that reality set in at a young age and, and saying, and just hearing here is our reality, but we're going to do this together. Do you feel that was an inflection point at that moment or did that set in far later? I actually feel like to some extent that started sooner. Like I feel like my mom was kind of building up towards that my whole life. Like she very much was open about um, our responsibilities in the household, our need to, you know, if we wanted to do something, we needed to contribute. We talked about pageants earlier and how did pageants. Well, they always had these really large, the pageants that I did, they were like statewide pageants. So they had these large admissions fees. So a lot of them were like $300. One was $900. And she did not pay for that for me. Her thing was like, you got to figure out a way to pay for it yourself. So mm -hmm. you want this goal? Like this thing seems really cool and awesome to you. Like, how are you going to do that? And it's funny. I was just telling a friend this the other day and they're kind of laughing. She actually would drive me up to businesses and let me out and say, all right, go knock on the door and see if they'll be your sponsor. <laughs> and I was like a kid sitting there being like, hi, I want to do a pageant. Will you be willing to sponsor me? And it felt so awkward and so uncomfortable. But she was like, this is what you want. And um, I had to work in the watermelon uh, fields. That was my um, first job was working in the farms locally, um, turning vines. It wasn't glamorous, but she always was trying to connect like if you have a goal, you have to work for it. And it's like she she really had been instilling that in us our whole lives. So even though that conversation was challenging my freshman year of high school, you know, it also she had become so good at connecting that here's a goal and you have to work for your goals kind of mindset since we were young that um, she was kind of pretty quickly able to shift me into that like perspective of like, this is exciting. Like you could win so much money. And like, what does that mean for your life? You don't have to stress out about money when you're in college. You know, you can do things that you want. Um, it's kind of funny with my story. I ended up going to Vanderbilt, which is a top 20 school here in Nashville, super competitive academically, but I really loved music. So that's one of the reasons I picked Vanderbilt was it's two blocks from Music Row. And that was like a great compromise with my mom. She's like, you can go and get your academics and have this strong school, but you can still do fun things. And because I had scholarships, I didn't have to stress out about money. So it was like a double win. I still got to pursue dreams and goals and 
really fun things when I was in college, but I got to do it because I didn't have the stress of money. Everything was paid for with scholarships. I think that's awesome perspective to see the bigger picture that you you did the unfun thing. You you worked and you sacrificed so that you could have better, so that you could enjoy and to live the life you felt called to live, not the life that was going to be dictated upon you. Right. And that's what I think is so important for for everyone to look at, especially, you know, we talk about it with young people, but I've been talking to a lot of people recently about student loan debt who are gripped with debt and they're looking at the moratorium coming to an end and they're kind of feeling overwhelmed and thinking that this is going to be their life for the next 10 or 20 years and, you know, and trying to encourage them to just pay off this debt as quickly as possible and to dive into, you know, the steps to work themselves out of debt and to knock it out. It's like, even though it can be hard, like it's just going to be a season. So a lot of people, I work here at Ramsey and we have the seven baby steps to help people get out of debt. And even though it can feel kind of overwhelming, it's like a lot, most people pay off their debt in 18 to 24 months. And it's like that season may be really hard, but it's a season that you go through so that you can have financial freedom in the future. Like there are these hustle seasons, these really hard seasons, but they pay off in the long run. Absolutely. And I, I think what I see a lot is I see a lot of resentment towards parents, towards the system that, you know, young adults, adults have all these student loans. And it's easy to say, I didn't know what I was getting into because we didn't. Mm. And I think it's easy to have resentment maybe towards mom and dad. But I always say we need to give mom and dad grace. You know, other people, yeah, they're, they don't have our best interests in mind. But I think our parents, I think they genuinely want the best for us. They love us, but they only know what they know. And if 80% of Americans are in debt, then of course, part of what they know is debt. And so I try to encourage the people that I have the privilege of serving to give grace and and know that we can't unwind that. We can't, we can't undo it. The people, the the folks in the documentary, they can't get a redo, but we have an opportunity to give our kids better. And I know you're, you're a new parent and I have, I have two young kids and my kids deserve better than normal. And, and I, I just think that the example that you're sharing of your own mom and, and, and setting the table early about if this matters, then we need to find a way to pay for it and work and work matters leading up to the hard conversation of, I'm sorry, I know maybe your friends are going to have their colleges paid for, but you're not. That's parenting. And and I just, I'm grateful that you're sharing this story because I think that the general consensus in our culture is that that's not what we want to do. We want to do the other way. We just want our kids to have everything. And I don't know, can you just maybe share if there's anything else you can share with parents? Because the people listening to this, most of them, there's some high schoolers listening. Hello, high school kids. But there's a lot of parents listening to this, that the cake is baked for them but it's not too late for their kids. Absolutely. Well, I love what you were saying about parents and, you know, not being hard on parents that allowed people to take out student loan debt because for the longest time in our in our country, it's been this thing where it's like education is everything. Getting a four-year degree at the most prestigious college that you can go to is is it. Like if you can do that, then your life is set. Like if you can go to the best university, a private school, then that's what that's what people were told for a long time. And I think one of the things that one of the messages that I'm trying to spread that we're trying to spread here is that, you know, you can go to a community college first and transfer and still have a great career. You can go to a public school and have a great career. We have to take all college at all costs off of that pedestal and normalize getting an education in different forms. Perhaps, you know, your your kid's going to go to trade school and they're going to be the best electrician or the best plumber and have a super successful career in that trade and absolutely love it. You know, perhaps they're going to go to, you know, the public four-year school versus the alma mater that's super prestigious and they're going to have a really great career and graduate debt-free. It's like we have to open our minds up to different options and different paths. And really, instead of just pushing like the, the school as being the end-all be-all, pushing, you know, what internships are you going to get? Who are you going to meet? What are, what things are you going to do to push yourself forward and to stand out for a job? Because like I said, we're seeing it in workplaces all across America. There are people sitting next to um, people from public school, people from community college, sitting next to people from 
the fanciest school that have $200,000 in student loan debt. So if you can go to an awesome school and do it debt free, by all means do it. I mean, I went to Vanderbilt and I absolutely loved it. It was great. Um, But would I do it with a huge amount of student loan debt? No, because I can see my friends, I can see my coworkers who are super successful with a public degree, with a public school degree. So I think just working to break down that notion that you have to go to a certain school at all costs is so important. And then just exploring your options. There are so many great options out there for getting a debt-free degree. So obviously there are scholarships. There's going to, you know, maybe a two-year school first and then transferring. Also make sure you look at universities based on what type of merit or aid-based scholarships they have. So a lot of people decide the college and then they work backwards, but look around and see, you know, are there schools that I could potentially go to and get offered a full ride? If you do have need Um, financial need, there's a lot of schools that actually have no loan policies. So if you have a high level of financial need, then they meet full need and you potentially could go with no student loans. It's almost like getting a full ride if you can get into that school. So explore and see if that's an option. Also, there's amazing tuition assistance programs now available. A lot of companies are giving people access to free college just by working there. So Starbucks, Chipotle, Walmart, Amazon, there's all sorts of companies now that are offering the opportunity to go to an online school or get some sort of degree while working part time, which is pretty awesome because it's like you could potentially get a four year degree completely paid for while still earning an income at the very same time and getting work experience. So I think that's pretty exciting. I think that's going to be kind of a new wave in the future of people being able to get work experience, earn money and go to college for free. That's super exciting. I just think that we're continually seeing more opportunities and more options for going debt free. But first, you have to break that mindset that you have to go a certain way, that you have to go to a certain school that's super expensive. And you you have to be open to the different options that are available. Yeah. Well, thank thank you for that. I think that I mean that's such fantastic advice. And I hope hopefully you can help continue to shift the narrative, to shift the culture in this because it matters and it's worth it. And you're saving one one future at a time doing your work. So thank you for the work that you're doing, the work you've done, and the work that you will continue to do. It's my pleasure and honor. It's it's really exciting seeing mindset shift and people get debt-free degrees. I'm reaching the spot in my career where you know I've been doing this long enough that I do get a regular flow of people going, hey, I did it debt-free. And it's just so exciting to see that. It's, all, it's, it's always good. You know, we don't do it for those little affirmations, but boy, they help. Well, it just helps to know that we are shifting the narrative. Like you said, like we we got to keep, there's so much work to do. And it's hard when you do see that the student loan industry is still growing. There are moments where you go, man, are we, are we, are we shifting the needle yet? And, you know, obviously this feels like a behemoth, the student loan industry. And so just chipping away at it, even if it's one student at a time, you know, it, it's, it makes the work so worth it. Yeah, thank you. We so we hear we talk about meaning over money, and, and we do talk about money. And but but we always say money's never about money; it's always about something bigger. And we talk about how do we navigate that tension between meaning and money. And so my final question for you, Christina, is how do you define a life of meaning? Mm, that's so good. I mean, I I define it with impact. You know, that's why I love hearing those stories. I love seeing impact and knowing that my why, the reason I get up every day is coming to fruition. That just makes such a huge difference to me. Um, Whenever I was in high school, just to quickly go back to the scholarship journey, one of the ways that I stood out in the application process was through volunteer work. So I did over a thousand hours of community service when I was in high school and just loved that. And it also happened to stand out in the application process. Um, My grandparents were missionaries that went to Haiti over 50 times. They led over 50 trips to Haiti um, doing missions work there. And I just think that heart for service has always been in me. And to get to do it in a way that really can get to the root of a lot of stress in people's lives makes such a difference. I mean, I was just thinking the other day about like how many statistics are out there about money being one of the biggest causes of divorce and just seeing so many people in my generation not being able to attain home ownership, not being able to have kids and feeling depression and so much stress about around this, this topic of money. It just, it makes me so excited and feel so honored to get to work in this field and in this space, because it's like, man, if we can help people improve their finances, it can bring them so many, so much peace in so many areas of their lives. Love it. 
Love that answer, Christina. Yeah. Well, before we before we end, you know, how can people get a hold of you, get in touch with you, anything you'd like to share with with our audience? Yeah, well, I'm really excited. So this month is National Financial Literacy Month, and we're doing a teacher appreciation giveaway. So if there are any teachers listening, or if you have a teacher in your life that you really appreciate, maybe they poured into your students' lives, I would love for you to share this information with them. They can go to christinaellis.com, Christina with a K, slash teacher, christinaellis.com slash teacher to sign up. We're giving away two $5,000 prizes and three $1,000 prizes. So we would love to see your teachers enter and hopefully we can say thank you to them. We're just very grateful for teachers. And then if anybody wants to follow me personally, you can follow me on Instagram at I am Christina Ellis. And that's Christina with a K. I am Christina Ellis. Awesome. Awesome. Yes. Go follow Christina. Teachers, go jump onto the website. It'll be awesome. Um, we just, we love teachers. I know, I know Christina loves teachers. And so teachers, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Christina. Thank you for joining us. We're so grateful that you came on and, and we just hope this next season of your life and your career is amazing. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's been really fun chatting with you. All right. Take care. I really enjoyed my conversation with Christina, and I hope you found value in it as well. As I've reflected on that conversation, a few takeaways really stood out to me. Number one, I would just say, I just love her heart for bending this culture that says college at any cost. And I love that phrase that she used, college at any cost. And, and I really like that she now has an enormous platform from which to do it. To, to pursue this, this passion of hers, to help people do it different. And I just love that. And I look forward to, if there's any way I can help her, I want to do that because I, I believe in her mission. I believe in what she is trying to do. I, 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 obviously, obviously, her story of getting a half million dollars of scholarships is wild. Now, will your kid or will, will you, if you are a teenager, will you get a half million dollars in scholarships? Maybe not. Maybe, but that's not the point. The point is you can make a meaningful dent in your college bill or get it all paid for. There's families doing it every single day. I, I know many of them. Christina is one of them, and she's walked alongside of many of them. And if families are doing it every day, why not yours? Why not your family? It's worth it. And I think that Christina made such a good point. If we treat it like a job, then we just do the work. We take care of business and let, let the rest take care of itself. And that's easy. It's, it's easy to say. It's hard to do. But the reality is, if we treat it like a job, just we, we, we go and we work and we get compensated. Scholarships are no different, except you just don't know what you're going to get paid. But in many cases, you will get paid more per hour than you would as a teenager doing really anything else. So we get to go make that happen. And then I think my last takeaway, on the parenting front, her mom is the real hero here. Her mom did two just critically important things that I think me and you and any other parent that is listening can really take away from this episode. Number one, being honest about the reality with her daughter when her daughter was in high school, early in high school. And those probably weren't easy conversations to, be, to admit that there was, there's not a lot here to help you. But then number two, to walk alongside of her child, encourage her, and help her find that better. As a parent, I think that's all we can do. Because whether we can afford to pay for our kids' college or not, we can be honest with them. We can help set expectations. And then we can walk alongside, encourage, love them well, and, and help them get from here to there. And their being is a healthy productive adult without the burden of college debt so that they can go out, live their calling, and live an amazing, meaningful life. And so I think that makes all the difference in the world. Parents, I hope that that piece right there, if that was your one takeaway, I think it was an important one. So that's all I have for today. Thank you, Christina, so much for coming on the podcast. We're just grateful for that. Really enjoyed our time together, and, and we look forward to crossing paths with you soon. If you'd like to get a hold of Christina, the links are in the show notes that she mentioned. I'll also link her books in the show notes. 
And if you want to get a hold of us, you can get a hold of us through Instagram, Meaning Over Money, or me, Travis Shelton, on Instagram. You can find our YouTube channel. And of course, you can find Meaning Over Money, which is our financial course for young adults, where we teach young adults how to live for the meaning and not for the money. And that's at meaningover.money. And if you decide to buy a course from us, please don't pay full price. As our way of saying thank you, you can get 25% off by using the promo code PODCAST25, PODCAST25. And if that's not for you, if you're not interested, that's okay. We're just glad that you're here, and we hope this podcast continues to add value to your journey. Take care, guys. 